John Wedger is a police whistleblower. As a CID officer, he discovered back coverings on child sex trafficking networks, which led to an investigative inquiry by the Independent Police Complaints Commission, delving into the depth of police involvement. He is um, one of the bravest men in the country uh, today by many people's reckoning. Uh, John Wedger, thank you for joining us. Please uh, speak freely to this commission. I'm recently retired from the Metropolitan Police where I served as a detective. I specialised in child abuse investigations and I, what is relevant to, uh, to me being here today was, was my service whilst on the uh, specialist vice unit. I had been asked to look into an allegation made by a 14 year old girl that she is being used as a prostitute. On looking into it, it appeared that this girl was one of many. She gave me another girl who in turn gave me another, in turn gave me another and it just spiralled. Uh, very, very quickly, um, we had dozens of young kids aging from 9 to 14 years old. All of them were subject to care orders. Uh, either looked after or, you know, um, in placements, homes or whatever, but all known to the, uh, the social services. Um, a lot of them were known to the police um, for being missing persons and everything else. And all of them were addicted to crack cocaine and heroin mm. and were all being pimped out, as the term goes, by one person, which was a, a female prostitute who was very well known to the Met Police. And this woman had connections with, alleged connections with um, high-ranked officers and also um, a local magistrate and um, someone that was high up here, executive status in the BBC. Uh, this woman seemed to work with impunity for many, many years. And when looking into it, this actual uh, racket had been going on for a long, long time. What I did was I exposed my findings I committed them to paper in what was just a basic intelligence report and I took it to a senior officer and what I must say that this isn't the first time that I'd been shut down for exposing um, child abuse offences. Uh, a couple of years prior to that, if I may jump the timeline, was I was on an inquiry looking into transient paedophiles that had failed to register and I found out that they were residing on canal boats within the inland waterway network of the UK. They had information from within the prison service that there were two um, paedophiles that were living on boats. Now boats um, had a lot of poignancy in as much as uh, there was freedom to travel. The canal network was very, very old and therefore didn't get policed. And children liked boats. And the BBC had a, a programme at the time um, which sort of... Um, uh, it, it, it was to do with uh, two little dolls that lived on a canal boat called Rosie and Jim and it was tied in at the same time as I was looking into this so kids were drawn to the waterways the, the, I'll get back to the main story but the, the reason for telling this bit was that I was told that there were, were two sex offenders I was asked to look into it as a field intelligence officer and if I found another two within a set period of time they'd be happy within that period of time I'd found 90 um I came into work and I was told by a high-ranked officer that the inquiry had been shut down and the reason given was that they couldn't afford the funding for me. But I had been approached by a Scotland Yard detective who told me, he said, um, when you investigate any crime and you do well at it, you get praised. When you look into child abuse cases, the opposite happens. Be very careful. He then told me about a cabinet minister that they'd investigated on a few occasions and on each occasion they've been shut down uh, so I was aware that this had gone on uh, when I questioned uh, the senior officer about you know the real reason he told me John I'm so sorry it's come from high up there's nothing I can do and promised me any job I wanted so I moved on to the the vice unit um, so I was expecting to be praised for what I found out uh, each day a new child would be found and it, it was just spiraling I was brought before um, someone who is now a very, very high-ranked officer in the UK indeed. And he sat me down and he said, John, um, I've got to be very uh, upfront with you. And I said, well, I'd like to be upfront with you, Governor, as well. And he said, you know, you're out of all the officers I've got here. There was about, I don't know, 40 officers. He said, you're, you're the second best one I've got. 
which was a good accolade, he said, but unfortunately, you've dug too deep. What the hell have you done? Now, on a personal level, um, since the uh, beginning of 2000, I'd brought up four children on my own, and this was common knowledge within my unit. And he said to me, if you ever disclose what you found out, you will lose your home, your children, and your job. You must shut the F up. And he said, you will be thrown to the walls. You have no idea who and what you are dealing with. He said, I'm warning you now, you must back away. Uh, and then he said something quite strange. And he said that if you say a word of this, um, and even if you make a complaint, it will come back to me and it will go in the bin. I and no one else will ever betray fellow rank. Shut your mouth. So I walked away from that, from that investigation and I moved on. I was offered to stay, but I couldn't. What was very strange was that the, the main um, witness, the young girl that came forward, was found dead in the street very shortly afterwards on a suspicious drug overdose, which sort of compounded matters. Um, I then moved on to um, work on child abuse investigations, which is slightly different to vice. And I, I can, if I have the time, explain why there is this compartmentalization within these institutions. And it's all down to remits and uh, justifiable reasons for actually doing nothing as opposed to doing something. Um, I went on to a child abuse unit in, in one of the poorer boroughs of London and I was asked if I would like, as well as an investigator, to take on a second role dealing with various sort of issues they have. And I was told you'll get a day here and there to go to a meeting. And I asked to look into uh, if there were anyone was dealing with children's homes. I was told no, there was an officer that was dealing with children's homes, uh, but she'd left two years ago and she didn't do anything anyway because nothing happens, there's no problem. And I asked this sergeant, are there any problems with child prostitution within the kids' homes? And she said, what you want about? No, of course not. I got a list, and this is almost real time as I'm telling it now, I got a list, faxed through to me from social services with all the children's homes. There was 26 kids' homes. I picked up the phone and I spoke to the fella and I asked him how many kids they have. And on, on an average, there's about five children reside in these children's homes. And I said, no, I'm not pointing the finger. No one's in any trouble. How many of these children do you lose at the weekend? Which is the usual pattern of, of missing, you know, when kids go missing. And so out, out of the five, we lose three. And I said, no, honestly, what happens to them? They went, oh, they've been pimped out. So I'd found this officer that had dealt with it for years had found none within this. Honestly, this was the time as we're speaking now within this period of minutes, I'd found three. By the end of that day, I'd found six. By the end of three days to five days, I'd found 50. I held a meeting with all the concerned agencies, which involved charities, which involved NGOs, which involved social services, and I highlighted the problem. And I was then harangued, really. I was attacked verbally by head of children's services for this borough, saying to me, what the effing hell have you done? I said, well, you knew about these kids. I said, yeah, but they hadn't come out, so we're not worried. The children were making money, so therefore the children weren't worried. The children had a boyfriend, which was their pimp. Therefore, they, they thought this was love. Um, and the children were also using drugs, so therefore they want to continue to use drugs. So they weren't coming to notice. So therefore, social services had written them off, despite the fact that the children's homes would constantly um, be getting in the logs that they were being picked up and they were going missing. These were regular missing persons. The police have a missing persons unit. They say so many thousands of kids go missing every year. They do, but a lot of them do return. But what is never looked into is what happens when they're going missing. They are working as prostitutes. Um, and again, the, the child abuse units won't look into them because they say it's not interfamilial because it's someone else pimping them out. The bigger cities have vice units Vice units will not deal with them because they say that these are kids subject to care orders. So no one looks into it and it goes on and it festers and it festers. And then funny enough, after this meeting, I was shut down and moved again. Um, I then came forward a couple of years later. I, I was actually genuinely concerned that I would lose my children. I, I know how powerful the police are and I know what they're, they're capable of um, having worked with them. I blew the whistle a few years ago 
and I was told that my allegations would be taken um, at the, the highest level. I asked to speak to a high-ranked female detective and this was questioned. And then they did get me a high-ranked female detective and she said to me, why are you talking to me? And no one else has said, because you cannot roll up your trouser leg. Uh, and she said, I understand exactly what you mean. They instigated allegations of corruption against high-ranked officers. Um, when you uh, investigate these um, crimes, as a, as a witness and informant as I was, you're meant to get regular updates every 28 days. I never received one in three years. The matter was passed from one unit to another unit. It ended up with the IPCC, who again did nothing and failed to update me, despite the fact that they had corroborating evidence. I met with other police whistleblowers uh, via a few concerned MPs. One of them was a lady called Maggie Oliver, who had exposed the scandal in Rochdale. Another one was a man called Lenny Harper, who had exposed the horrendous goings on at a kid's home called Hope de la Garenne in Jersey. Each one of them uh, echoed each other. They both said, they're going to come for you and they will come hard. And I said, what do I expect? They said, right, you will be served with gross misconduct papers. You will be interviewed. They will find against you. You will be sacked and you will probably face a court case and, and may go to jail. Now, the threats that was echoed to me, you'll lose your home your job, your children. At the same time, the police stopped paying me. I went without wages for nearly three years. I had three children at home, four children, sorry. Um, then what happened was that they served me gross misconduct papers. And I was told what it will be for, will be for data protection violations, which seems to be a common occurrence. <coughs> I got served with numerous data protection violations. Each one could have given me a two year prison sentence. Um, and this continued and continued. Now, what also happened um, during this period was that one of my children was um, involved in a life-changing and catastrophic accident in which he was initially declared dead. Uh, they revived him. He was on life support for many, many months. Um, I got called from the hospital uh, to attend the hospital where they had actually lost him. He'd been dead for 10 minutes. So I was called down to the hospital to um, basically identify him. I turned up and they had actually revived him within this period, but they deemed him as brain dead, although he was on full 100% um, uh, life support. Uh, a colleague of mine was so concerned as I had no money. And for three days I slept in my car and stayed by my son's side. My son actually uh, made signs of, of life and I was able to return home. But my colleague had, had brought this to the attention of senior officers, just saying, you know, you've got to help this man. He's done actually done nothing wrong. The Met Police's response to this, when I got home, they'd sent two child protection officers round to interview my youngest boy on allegations that I'd left him home alone while I was with my dying son. So the um, threats of you will lose your home your job and your children rang true. I persisted. I refused to give up and I set up a forum, a working group with all the police whistleblowers and it extended and it, and it branched out. The uh, IPCC stopped investigating the crime. Um, I was meant to be given a full breakdown of what went on and I was given a one paragraph letter and told not to contact them again. We're not investigating it. They're uh, answer was that the three high-ranked officers that are accused of corruption they went and spoke to them and they denied it and that was the extent of their investigation and all them years as an investigator I've been doing it wrong you've just got to ask someone if they've done it and if they say no that's it and that was that was what they expected me to swallow and tell me not to contact them again I took the matter to the policing minister at the time uh, a member of the Privy Council and a member of the government's cabinet he met with me and he was actually to my surprise appalled he arranged for a meeting with the home office the home office then got their independent investigation team in, involved and stated that there will be an independent investigation into my claims and they deemed that the met police and the ipcc had failed and they will look into it i was summoned to a meeting 
and it was a fully recorded meeting in, and it was witnessed and in which the cabinet minister handed my paperwork over to the home office officials and um, that was an official handover of the paperwork which I supplied to him. They then gave me their assurances that they will um, be in touch with me and give me a 24 hour contact number and said they will um, investigate this independently. I never heard from them again. They have since denied um, receiving any paperwork when pushed. They admitted they did receive it, but have now lost it. We are seeing police failings in respect to child prostitution hemorrhaging in this country, but we are seeing them on a provincial level. We're seeing them in Rochdale, Blackpool, Rotherham. We're seeing them in Oxford, Aylesbury, Swindon, all on a provincial level. London is one of the largest urban conurbations in the Western world. It has got one of the biggest police forces. We haven't heard one thing about organised child prostitution in London. And the reason being is that those high up have been covering it up. And this goes right to the heart. I was um, met with, as I said, Lenny Harper. Children were killed at Haute de la Garenne, in which Lenny Harper had forensic evidence, which was then went missing. And he said to me, be careful, what you're looking at will go right to the heart of the establishment. I sat down with the Commissioner of the Metropolitan Police, Cressida Dick, and I explained to her what was going on. And I explained the dynamics of how you groom a child. I said, I can take a child out of the care system. I can groom that child. I can have sex with that child. I can get my friends to have sex with that child. I can pimp that child out. You have not appointed one officer to investigate that. Yet if I leant over my fence and called my neighbour a derogatory term, I'd lose my home, my job, I'd be signing on a register and I'd never work for the Met Police again. How is that justifiable? How is it justifiable? Um, I now work with victims and survivors of abuse. I help out with... Um, recovering alcoholics and drug addicts. I'm working in collusion now with one of the um, most notorious gangsters uh, the UK had and the convicted murderer, Chris Lambriano. And I've never had such support and compassion mm. from these people, yet the police would have had me swinging from a rope if they've had their own way. When we look at our prison ser service, we look at our prison system, 75% of uh, inmates are illiterate. This is in the UK, they're illiterate. 75% of our inmates have come from abused backgrounds. We have a recidivism rate of 75%. The system does not work. Child abuse is at the root.